Welcome to the Clegg series, When Black Men Ruled the World. In this set of tapes, we shall reveal little known or acknowledged facts of history about black people in ancient times. On the cover of its issue of January 1988, Newsweek magazine carried a painting of a young black couple flanking the biblical tree of life. The picture was captioned, The Search for Adam and Eve. Newsweek has revealed what many scientists and scholars now believe that Africa was the birthplace of the human family, that the first members of what we now describe as the modern human race were black Africans, and that all human beings around the world share common roots in prehistoric Africa. In other words, we all stem from the same African family tree. For thousands of years, the only people on Earth were Africans. They migrated throughout the great continent and made many discoveries along the way. They learned to domesticate animals, to cultivate crops and to build shelters for protection against the elements. They also organized themselves into families, clans, and tribes. During what is called the Pleistocene Age, which ended about 10,000 years ago, the region which is now referred to as the Sahara had a climate much cooler and wetter than it is today. This part of Africa was covered with grasslands and forests, as well as a number of lakes and streams. Elephants, giraffes, and other animals roamed the land, which was also populated by a highly advanced black people whose prehistoric rock paintings, still visible today, provide a clear image of life during that time. By 7,000 BC, the once fertile region, which we call the Sahara, had dried up, and most black people who lived there migrated toward the upper regions of the Nile Valley in the interior of Africa. Other people, also fleeing the spreading desert, traveled further south or headed northward in the direction of the Mediterranean Sea. Part one of our series begins with the people who settled along the Nile Valley. As we shall see, the Nile River extends over 4,000 miles from its beginning near the heart of the African continent northward to the Mediterranean Sea. The southernmost portions of the Nile, which are closest to its origins, are called the Upper Nile while the northern reaches of the river near the Mediterranean Sea are called the Lower Nile. The entire length of the Nile River extends through the continent of Africa. In other words, no portion of this great river crosses Europe, Asia, or any other land mass. All of the great civilizations that sprang from the Nile were also located on the continent of Africa. The saga you are about to witness will take you back to the ancient Nile, to Nubia and Egypt, the first great nations on Earth. It is a summary of that far away, now almost forgotten, golden age in the history of black people. It was a time when black pharaohs and queens did indeed rule the civilized world of their day, and the achievements of these ancient people have had an important impact on modern society. Let us now turn to part one of the Clegg series, Egypt during the Golden Age. The Nile River, rising out of the interior of Africa, rushes down the mountains on its journey to the Mediterranean Sea. On its way, it carries precious fertile earth, which it deposits on its banks. For a few miles on each side of the Nile, there is a green belt that quickly melts into the surrounding desert. About 10,000 years ago, people began migrating toward the Nile and ultimately drifting into and settling its fruitful plain. An ancient and proud people who would build a great civilization, who would create an empire that would extend into the interior of Africa, engulf Asia Minor, embrace the Middle East and influence the entire Mediterranean world. These ancient people would build monuments of great magnitude and splendor. Monuments that would be the envy of the ancient world. Monuments that would serve as a blueprint and foundation for modern civilization. They also invented law and mathematics, science, writing, music and agriculture. Who were these people? Where did they come from? Strong evidence indicates that they came from the south, from a country through which the Nile flows, 
from the land of Nubia, or what we call the Northern Sudan in Africa. It was only natural for ancient explorers to follow the Nile River in order to find where it was going, and in doing that, to settle along its banks and to ultimately found a great and thriving civilization. The Nubians of antiquity stated that Egypt was a colony of their land and that the Egyptians derived their laws and customs from their Nubian cousins to the south. A number of scholars hold this opinion today. The pharaonic civilization that later came to characterize ancient Egypt had already existed in what we call Nubia uh, for at least 300 years before the uh, uh, first dynasty. Now, as far as I'm concerned, Egypt and Nubia were part of the same cultural complex. There was no essential cultural, linguistic, ethnic, or uh, racial difference between them. The differences, such as they were, were in the matter of regional differences, much as the difference you might find in England between, say, an Englishman and a Welshman, in the Central Europe between a German and an Austrian, in Italy between an Italian, for example, and a Sicilian. So even though these are regional variations, if you will, they still belong to the same general civilization complex. So did Egypt and Nubia, and the Egyptians themselves said so. They themselves knew that their civilization derived from the southern part of their, oh well, uh, excuse me, south of their borders, and they knew that it derived from what we call Nubia, or Ethiopia. So civilization itself descends the Nile from inner Africa, if you will, it crystallizes in Nubia, and then reaches its highest and final form in the land called Kamet, or ancient Egypt, over a period of 4,000 years uh, of Egyptian, unbroken Egyptian civilization. Modern evidence appears to confirm the tradition that civilization traveled northward from Nubia into Egypt. Skulls and skeletons unearthed in Nubia and Egypt are of the same or similar African racial type. Some of the most ancient paintings and drawings of Nubians and Egyptians also depict them as a distinctly African people. As Dr. Finch has noted, Egypt's general political structure and divine kingship appear to have been modeled after the Tassetti dynasty of Nubia that preceded that of Egypt by over 200 years. In other words, there were pharaohs ruling Nubia long before Egypt became a nation. Some scientists insist that pyramid building also began in Nubia and was refined and perfected after the Nubians moved northward and settled in Egypt. Even mummification appears to have started in Nubia and to have spread northward into Egypt 500 years after it was invented. Nubia was also considered the land of the gods and the spiritual home of the Egyptian people. Perhaps that is why the chief beneficent gods and goddesses of Egypt, such as Osiris and Isis, were depicted as blacks. Finally, during all of her periods of upheaval, chaos, and foreign invasions, Egypt was rescued and reunited by powerful black men from the Nubian south. This was true of the Mentohoteps in the Middle Kingdom. It was true of almost the first in the New Kingdom. And it was true of Pianki and Taharka during the 25th dynasty. Although not all scientists and scholars agree, the weight of evidence certainly points toward a black origin of Egyptian civilization. In time, of course, Asians and Europeans settled Lower Egypt near the Mediterranean Sea and ultimately intermingled with the native black population. Nevertheless, Egypt's cultural, physical, and spiritual legacy was chiefly derived from the black Nubian South. This no doubt explains why, in later years, the visiting Hebrews, Greeks, Romans, and others described the ancient Egyptians as black-skinned with close curled hair. The distinguished writer, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, captured the opinions of the ancients when he wrote, We conclude, therefore, that the Egyptians were Negroid, and not only that, but by tradition they believed themselves descended, not from the whites or the yellows, but from the black people of the South. Thence they traced their origin, and toward the South in earlier days, they turned the faces of their buried corpses. Du Bois might also have added that the Egyptians themselves called their country Kemet, which many scholars interpret as land of the blacks. Now that we've learned about the origin of these ancient people, 
Let us see how Egypt became a great African nation. Because of the surrounding desert, Egypt was shielded from invasion for thousands of years. During that time, various people who occupied the Nile Valley began working together. The Nile overflowed its banks every year. Controlling the river was important if the people wanted to grow food successfully. The Egyptians first formed villages that cooperated with each other. Cooperation led to organization, and organization led to the building of a great nation. A little over 5,000 years ago, another important step took place. At that time, the nation was divided into two lands, Upper and Lower Egypt. A black man, Narmer, united the two lands into one. This followed a war in which Narmer's troops defeated Asian immigrants who had settled in Lower Egypt. Narmer became the first pharaoh or king of Egypt following the great kings of Tasseti in Nubia. This pharaoh began the rule of what is called the dynasty, which is a line of kings and queens of the same family. Narmer had a glorious reign of 62 years. One of his greatest achievements was diverting the Nile River and creating the delta where he built the city of Memphis. This was the beginning of Egypt's golden age. Little is known of the pharaohs who followed Narmer during the first and second dynasties. Some of them, such as King Kasakam and King Pa'a Neneter, appear to have been stern and powerful men. During the reigns of these pharaohs, Egyptian society evolved into classes. First, there were the peasants or laborers. Then came the builders, artists, jewelers, and other skilled workers. After them were the warriors, priests, and officials. Finally, there was the pharaoh or king. The women of Egypt were also an integral part of the society. Many of them engaged in the same labor that men did, and they had equal opportunity to own, manage, and receive property. There were also many prominent women in ancient Egypt, some of whom reigned during the Golden Age. Women in particular. You have a woman whose name is Hetha Ferris. She is the great royal wife of Sneferu, who commissioned three massive pyramids, and the mother of Khufu, but in the Sixth Dynasty, at the end of the Sixth Dynasty, you have a woman known as Nitocris, and she's spoken of specifically by Herodotus as being a pharaoh, and also the person who commissioned the third of the Great Pyramid Projects at Giza. And she's called the loveliest and fairest woman of her time. The most renowned Egyptian women ruled during the Middle and New Kingdoms. A few were even as powerful as the great pharaohs themselves. Other women were content to exercise their influence behind the throne. Let us move ahead now to the third dynasty. By this time, Egypt was well on its way to becoming the extraordinary nation it was destined to be. Many of its achievements were staggering. For example, Imhotep, the brilliant philosopher, architect, and scientist, also became the true father of medicine. Through his influence, the Egyptians developed antiseptics, vaccinations and advanced surgical techniques and they found cures for numerous diseases in short the egyptians laid the foundation for modern medical science scientific medicine begins in ancient egypt that is to say we look at the edwin smith surgical papyrus i call it the founding document of scientific medicine anywhere in the world from the point of view of the sciences that we call the uh, if we call the related disciplines of medical science that is anatomy physiology pathology pharmacology those were organized as coherent scientific disciplines first in ancient egypt their first medical schools were built and erected in ancient egypt the first organized system of instruction and of teaching were uh, first established in ancient egypt the first surgery the first neurosurgery the first investigations into cardiovascular physiology. All this began in the ancient kingdom of the Nile in the northeast uh, quadrant of Africa 6,000 years ago. In fact, so well known was ancient Egypt's primacy 
in the area of medical science that Hippocrates would have never had the audacity to have called himself the father of medicine, because he knew better. He would have said, as Homer did, that in medicine, Egypt leaves the rest of the world behind. That was accepted as a matter of fact uh, in the ancient world throughout ancient Egypt's 4,000 year history. All of the ancient Greeks who made a name for themselves in medicine studied in Egypt. The Egyptians also now appear to have developed their own legal system with scribes and judges. Long before the nation of Greece, which was once thought to have been the seat of Western law, was born. What is more, the Egyptians invented the hieroglyphic writing system. They produced the first clock and calendar, and they introduced agricultural science to the ancient world. Above all else, though, Egypt is known for its pyramids, the bulk of which were also constructed during the Golden Age. First, there was the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, built by Imhotep during the Third Dynasty. This is the oldest large stone structure in the world. Originally, other buildings and courtyards were constructed near the Step Pyramid, and this entire complex was enclosed by a wall 1,500 feet long by 900 feet wide. Today, however, the only prominent remaining structure is the Step Pyramid. King Sneferu of the Fourth Dynasty built the so-called Bent Pyramid several miles south of Saqqara. This structure has no steps, but is straight-sided except for a change of angle in the middle. Finally, there was the Great Pyramid, built for the Pharaoh Khufu, whom the Greeks called Cheops, also during the Fourth Dynasty. The Great Pyramid, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, is indeed a magnificent monument to contemplate. Still standing today, it originally rose 481 feet and is estimated to have contained 2,300,000 blocks of stone. The area it covers is large enough to hold the cathedrals of Florence, Milan, and St. Peter's in Rome, as well as St. Paul's and Westminster Abbey in London. The Great Pyramid contains enough stone to construct 30 Empire State Buildings. If all the stones in the pyramid were sawed into blocks one foot on an edge and then were laid end to end, they would stretch two-thirds of the way around the globe at the equator. There are about 80 pyramids remaining in Egypt and 100 in Nubia, or what is today called the Northern Sudan. Although scientists are not certain of the purpose of these ancient structures, it is widely believed that they serve as tombs for members of the Egyptian royal family. We have looked at the black origin of the ancient Egyptians and we've spoken of their major achievements. Now let us turn to the pharaohs who governed this great nation during the Golden Age. There are many rulers of the Third Dynasty, the most prominent of whom was Zoser. During his reign of 19 years, Egypt's borders were extended into the interior of Africa. Copper mines were exploited in the Sinai. Extensive construction took place and the Step Pyramid was built. The Fourth Dynasty also brought forth a line of great black pharaohs, some of whose names we have mentioned. Sneferu was a distinguished ruler who successfully defeated the Nubians and Libyans in battle. He also constructed vessels nearly 170 feet long. He was a kind and gentle monarch. His successors were Khufu, during whose reign the Great Pyramid was built, Dedefre, whose pyramid was erected north of Giza at Abu Raj, Khafre, builder of the second Great Pyramid and whose facial likeness is found in the mysterious Sphinx, and Menkari, a just and forthright ruler whose spiritual temperament prompted many to worship him as a god. The first four dynasties of ancient Egypt represented a time of unprecedented splendor and glory. It was the technological high point of the black race. The Old Kingdom is a great pyramid building age. It's an age of great stability in Egypt, um, of great internal um, construction projects. I think that when we look at the Old Kingdom, once again, we're looking at the first um, physicians, what, such as Imhotep. You're looking at the massive construction projects. You're looking at the internal stability. You look in the Sixth Dynasty, 
when the pyramids were still being constructed at the reign of Pepe II, who reigned for 94 years. Here's a man who he was a young, a boy who was 10 years old when he became the king of Kemet, dies at the age of 104. And that tells us that these people knew a great deal about science, about medicine. The 5th and 6th dynasties still witnessed Egyptian supremacy in the ancient world, but a gradual decline set in that would pick up momentum at the close of the period. The names and personalities of the 5th dynasty kings remain a mystery because many of them are only known by their statues. Yet it is clear that a number of these rulers were both efficient and adventurous. For example, they formed strong navies that braved the seas and spread Egyptian culture abroad. This has prompted many scholars to ask, during the course of their long history, did the ancient Egyptians sail to the New World before Columbus? The Egyptians had sturdy ships that may have made the journey. Numerous Apricoid sculptures suggest an ancient black presence in the New World. Even Mexican pyramids, hieroglyphs, and cultural artifacts provide strong evidence that the Egyptians sailed to the Americas in ancient times. It's evident, without going into a lot of scientific and technical detail, that they had already they knew that the Earth was round. They knew that the Earth was tilted on its axis. They knew that the Earth revolved around the sun. They had already, they had already determined, uh, they had already had ways of determining the minute, uh, the length, of, excuse me, the minute of arc in the heavens of movement of stars. So they had already learned how to determine celestial longitude and terrestrial longitude and latitude. So they would have had more than enough astronomical knowledge to enable them to navigate almost anywhere in the world. And they would have had craft, that is watercraft, seaworthy enough to make those voyages. And I think voyages crop not only across the Atlantic, but across the Pacific to what we call the New World probably began in, in prehistoric times. And so that uh, America was a cross world, crossroads for the world long before there ever was a Columbus, thousands of years before there ever was a Columbus. And there's nothing inherently impossible in terms of their uh, level of science and technology um, and astronomical knowledge that would have prevented the ancient Egyptians from making such voyages. The Sixth Dynasty spanned a period of 155 years. It marked the first time that large numbers of regional governors began to break away from the central rulership of the pharaoh to independently control their own territories. One of the most prominent pharaohs of this period was Pepe I, who quelled internal strife and strengthened the monarchy. His son, Pepe II, ruled Egypt for 94 years, the longest reign in world history. The death of Pepe II was followed by the decline of the Sixth Dynasty and the ultimate collapse of the Old Kingdom of Egypt. This then marked the end of 1,000 years of African splendor, the zenith of black civilizations, the world's first golden age. Let us now review how it all happened, how Egypt came to be a great African nation. First, black people from various parts of Africa migrated to the Upper Nile. There they founded the nation of Nubia. Then the Nubians moved down the Nile Valley and settled the land which was later to be called Egypt. They made many contributions to Egyptian civilization, including the divine kingship, mummification, a strong spiritual heritage, and perhaps even pyramid building. In time, however, Egypt evolved into a separate and distinct nation in its own right a nation that laid the foundation of world civilization, but most especially, a nation that provided the roots for black history and culture. Egypt's great and ancient legacy remains with us today. This architecture, this science, this agriculture, these hieroglyphics, this legal system, these pyramids, these pharaohs, and these queens 
are the great heritage of black people everywhere and have influenced the evolution of civilization around the world. Although its golden age had passed away, black Egypt would indeed rise again in the Middle Kingdom, in the New Kingdom, and during the 25th Dynasty. The entire ancient world would marvel at the resilience and power of these magnificent people. As the distinguished author, Flora Lugard, has written, the annals of all of the great nations of Asia Minor are full of them. The Mosaic records allude to them frequently. But while they're described as the most powerful, the most just, and the most beautiful of the human race, they are constantly spoken of as black. And there seems to be no other conclusion to be drawn than that at that remote period of history, the leading race of the Western world was a black race. In subsequent episodes of the Glegg series, we shall explore Egypt's Middle Kingdom and World Empire, the role of black women in antiquity, and black personalities of the Holy Bible. This concludes part one of the Glegg series, Egypt during the Golden Age. daughter and disciple Tetrashiri. Our land, Egypt, has been invaded and conquered by evil forces. They destroy our houses, they desecrate your temples, and they build shrines to strange gods. beloved daughter, our nation is in distress. Come and save Egypt. Save your daughters and their families so that peace and prosperity will prevail again. And your daughters shall reign
Welcome to part two of the Clegg series, The Daughters of Isis, Black Women in Antiquity. I am your host, Legrand H. Clegg II. This videotape and booklet supplement part one of this series, When Black Men Ruled the World, Egypt During the Golden Age. In part one, we briefly considered the origin of the human family in Africa and then turned to the beginning of civilization, first in Nubia and then in Egypt. We dealt with Egyptian pyramids, hieroglyphic writing, medical science, literature, law, art, architecture, maritime skills, as well as the nation's political and social structure. We placed emphasis on the great pharaohs and the prominent role they played in world history. Part one was intended to introduce the concept of African or black men as the fathers of the human family and civilization. In part two, The Daughters of Isis, we brought in our focus to include black women in antiquity. For the very first time on videotape, we present a comprehensive history of the black woman in ancient times. We shall see her as the original mother, fertility idol, goddess, queen mother, and lady of the Nile. We shall very briefly trace her steps from prehistoric Africa into Europe, Western Asia, India, Southeast Asia, Australia, the Pacific Islands, and even the early New World. Then we shall return to Africa where the record of black female achievement is very profound and long-standing. This is a bold and dynamic venture made possible by the pioneering work of many distinguished scholars and scientists whose publications are cited in the booklet that accompanies this tape. To introduce the saga of black women in world history, we first focus on Isis, an ancient and venerated deity who for many people has come to represent the highest form of motherhood, beauty, and virtue. To capture the essence of the ISIS tradition, we interviewed Renoko Rashidi, assistant editor of the Journal of African Civilizations, inside a replica of a hidden underground Egyptian tomb, and Anita Red Terry, who is on the staff at Santa Monica Community College, in studio. African name for ISIS is Aset. Spelled with, if you want to put vowels in it, A-U-S-E-T. The Egyptians, or Camites, actually spelled it A-S-T. And the name is fundamental. The name is profound. It means the throne. Mm -hmm. What seems to suggest, now, let me digress a moment. Generally, when we see Isis, she's connected with the god Asar, or Osiris. And it is said that on the first day, a loud voice called out into the world that the king of all has come. And that king was Asar, Osiris. And he was brought forth unto the earth and he contributed many, many great things. The development of agriculture, all the things that we associate with early civilization. On the second day, his brother Set was born. And Set is, identif and Set is identified with the color red. Set is just the opposite of Osiris, or Asar. And um, he is said, according to, I think, a story by Plutarch, not even to have come forth through his mother's womb, but to birth forth, but he supposedly burst forth through her side tearing a gaping wound. And he is just the opposite of his brother, Asar. He is the epitome of evil, or disorder and chaos, mm -hmm. social disorder. Because I'm not even sure if the Kemites had a word. The Egyptians had a word for evil. Mm. At any rate, he and his brother are engaged in a perpetual conflict. You might say it's a struggle similar to light and day, or uh, darkness and light. They are the original twins, in a sense. Now, set according to the story, had, and there are many stories according to this, long before Christian Bible or Torah or Bhagavad Gita or the Quran, etc., Rig Veda. Uh, thousands of years in Egyptian, I should say, African history, these stories emerge, African mythology and religion. It is said that Set has his brother murdered. In fact, not only does he have him murdered, but he cuts his body up into 14 pieces and scatters the pieces throughout the land of Kemet or Egypt. Now, his wife, Aset, becomes very instrumental in the story now because when she hears the news of her husband's death, Os Osiris's death, Osiris's death, she's grief-stricken. She's terribly upset, but she does not completely lose her head and she does not lose hope. And she wanders over the land of Kemet, she wanders over Egypt, and she gathers 13 of the 14 missing pieces. And she takes them and puts them in the form of a mummy, wraps them up in the form of a mummy, and prays to the gods of ancient Egypt and they, in fact, restore life to the slain Osiris. Now, the 14th piece is very critical. Oh, yes, it's genitals. 
which has been thrown into the Nile River where it was swallowed by catfish. Uh, last time I ate a catfish was shortly before I heard the story. <laughs> now, that is important though. This is important because in spite of that, Isis is able to, Aset is able to conceive a child. And that child turns out to be Horus. And the major function of Horus is to avenge his father's death. Horus grows up, he begins to vanquish his uncle Set, who murdered his father, and Isis intervenes. Now in that story, you have so many profound concepts. You have the story of one brother slaying another brother, similar to Cain and Abel. You have the story of an immaculate um, conception, the virgin birth. You have the story of um, rising from the dead, the resurrected savior. You even have a story that deals with divine compassion because it is Isis or Aset who suffers the most other than obviously Asar at her husband's death. But she is the one who steps in and intervenes and prevents uh, the murderer from actually meeting his just due. So Isis is very, very profound. She is said to have wandered the land of Kemet and in ancient times she becomes the most powerful of all the ancient deities to the extent that it begins to make you wonder if we are not getting just the tail end of the story, that in ancient times God is not in fact initially identified in the form of a female. Because once again the name Isis or Aset means the throne, the seat of power. So Isis is very profound and then we are later to identify her with Mary uh, and the story of uh, the Madonna and Child. Danita, you've done considerable research on black queens, goddesses, madonnas, and black women in ancient times. One area of interest is that of Isis and her legacy. Could you talk about that? The Lake Isis was one of the most uh, dominant goddesses in ancient Egypt, and her legacy uh, lives on today in uh, the Black Madonna. Isis and Osiris are said to be the, the ones, the deities responsible for civilizing ancient Egypt. And they were brother and sister. They were brother and sister. And husband and wife. And husband and wife. Okay. And that uh, type of relationship was uh, not condoned for uh, the general Egyptian population that you see it sometimes within the royal family. And it had a uh, meaning to it, that divine meaning, that, that the type of relationship they had. Uh, but they went about civilizing uh, ancient Egypt. They taught the people agriculture. They taught them how to grow corn, how to grow wheat. They uh, taught them how, how to raise livestock. They taught them the institution of marriage and, uh, and of maintaining families. And they, uh, they taught the women how to, uh, to grind corn, how to weave and uh, spin uh, cloth, uh, spin thread and weave cloth. Mm -hmm. And so the Egyptian people attribute their civilization and their civilized behavior to uh, Isis and Osiris. And that they also the, uh, tended to be pious religious people and that they felt that Isis and Osiris exemplified this in their uh, relationship. Inspiration for the title of this videotape and booklet was derived from a distinguished organization of black women the Imperial Court Daughters of Isis. In the early part of the 20th century, black women in several American cities began to organize themselves around shrine temples that served as centers for the Prince Hall Shriners, an order of black masons. An auxiliary of female members of the Prince Hall Shriners was formally established at the annual session of the ancient Egyptian Arabic Order Nobles Mystic Shrine in Detroit, Michigan on August 24, 1910. From its inception, the Imperial Court Daughters of Isis included dynamic women who were dedicated to serving humanity. The leaders of the organization varied in age and profession and came from different parts of the nation. For over 80 years now, this group has focused on a program that stresses leadership development, creates an effective network among its members and community organizations, recognizes the historic and current achievements of black women, provides role models for young women, and promotes high moral standards and academic achievements. The current commandress of the Imperial Court Daughters of Isis is Margaret P. Warren of Los Angeles. 
She's had a long and distinguished career in government and the private sector, and has made noteworthy contributions to a number of charitable, civil rights, and religious organizations. Although in this videotape we are presenting black women as the spiritual daughters of ISIS, the truth is that long before ISIS became prominent, black women had appeared on the world stage. Let us turn now to the first women on earth, black women in prehistory. For many years, anthropologists, paleontologists, and other scientists have focused on the continent of Africa in their search for the origins of the human family. Some of the most important discoveries of human fossils have been made in Northeast Africa, particularly in Kenya, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. Small parties of Africans and Europeans headed by such scientists as members of the Louis B. Leakey family have combed the Northeast African terrain in search of our prehistoric black ancestors. The ancient soil of East Africa has yielded the richest human remains in the world. Prehistoric fossils similar to these have been given many names, such as Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo sapiens, and Homo sapiens sapiens, or modern human beings. One of the authorities with whom we spoke regarding the origins of human beings in Africa was Dr. Charles S. Finch of Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. One thing that is indubitably clear is that Africa is the cradle of the entire human race. From 4, 000, excuse me, from 4 million years ago all the way up to 200,000 years ago, the stepwise sequence leading in an evolutionary progression from early pre-human hominid ancestors all the way up to modern human beings occurred in Africa and Africa alone. Not that there weren't any migrations out of Africa, but those migrations did not have any impact on human evolutions leading up to modern human beings until after um, our human beings in fact left Africa. Now what do I mean by that? A man by the name of Wainscott from England has said is that all of the populations around the globe are descended from small founder populations that left Africa probably no later than 100,000 years ago. This means that, as C.W. Stringer has said, that all six and a half billion people on this planet are Africans under the skin. Because if we go back far enough, everyone has an African ancestor. Now, to clarify our earlier point, uh, when I made the assertion that as far as human evolution was concerned, there, it all occurred in Africa up until after the final migration, this has to do with the origin and development of races. That you did not see the development of specific human races until about 50,000 years ago when these founder populations left Africa, began to inhabit certain parts of the globe, Europe, Asia, and then because of rather um, sudden and drastic climactic changes, underwent some adaptations that led to the development of variations in the human species which we today call races or subgroups of the human species. But as I say, if you look at the root and the trunk, you are talking about a root and a trunk that is in African soil literally. So that in effect, all six and a half billion people who live on the planet today are descended from a founding population or an original population that emerges in Africa certainly 200,000 years ago very likely, no later than 140,000 years ago, and does not leave Africa until maybe 100,000 years ago. In some of his many books and articles, Dr. Finch has noted that our knowledge of human origins is largely based on the skeletal and sculptural relics of African women. Perhaps the most prominent fossil remains of our female ancestors have been those of an ancient African woman whom modern scientists call Lucy. She may have looked similar to this reconstruction that appeared in Discover magazine in 1988. Lucy lived about three and a half million years ago. She was three feet tall and 60 pounds. Her remains were found in Ethiopia. Lucy and her sisters were undoubtedly strong, proud, and courageous. Alongside their mates, they probably hunted and gathered food, 
lived in small groups, and carried a nursing child as they traveled across the land. Whether we call her Lucy or Eve, the African woman left her mark over a broad spectrum of the prehistoric and ancient worlds. Small carvings of short, heavy-set women with thick, woolly hair, often called fertility idols, have been found in Europe, from Italy to Russia. Scientists have labeled the people of that time Grimaldis, after the caves in France, where their skeletons were first discovered. Some authorities believe that these ancient blacks migrated into Europe from Africa more than 30,000 years ago and were part of a loose cultural network that extended from South Africa into Central Europe. Sculptures, cave drawings, weapons and tools of the Grimaldis suggest that they were a highly advanced people who held black women in general and motherhood in particular in very high esteem. In a lot of the slide presentations I do, I tend to show a, a black woman from the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal. And then I compare that photograph with Venus of Wellendorf, these ancient fertility uh, figures that you're referring to. You can go to southern Africa or Zania and find one of these Khoisan sisters, Khoi Khoi, who is oftentimes called a Hottentot. Mm -hmm. So this is the most famous one, but you find it throughout France. My colleague James Brunson has located one in the, in the former Soviet Union that's about 14,000 years old, and you do have a lot of them in um, other parts of Asia. I would think they would tend to represent the widespread movement of ancient black people in a prehistoric period, and by prehistoric I mean before written records, before written history, and um, they may be religious figurines. The earliest carvings of human-like people that you find anywhere in the world are almost exclusively of women, particularly of women with, who are obese, with large breasts, and very heavily developed buttocks and thighs. Why? Because this is an image of female fecundity or fertility and abundance and productivity, and of course, with large, large of breasts, the image of female uh, capacity for nurturance. You see this in Europe. You certainly see that in the Nile Valley and elsewhere. Uh, and we find, by the way, in the Nile Valley, that the oldest deity, the oldest form of the deity, takes uh, shape as Ta-Ert. Ta-Ert is the hippopotamus goddess who was one of the earliest images of the deity because, and who was feminine maternal because she was obese and therefore was an image of the pregnant female. Also, the hippopotamus, by floating in the, inter, in the waters of inner Africa, would have been an image of uh, would have been an amniotic image and a birth image. Interestingly enough, Ta means land or earth, Ert means great. So Ta Ert means great earth. And so she was, shall we say, an animal symbol of earth itself, earth being the primordial mother of all, from which, out of which life comes and to which life returns. So all of the original fertility goddesses, as we call them, were mother goddesses and earth goddesses. As we have noted, prehistoric Africans did not end their migrations in Europe. They were adventurous pioneers whose descendants climbed rugged mountains, crossed torrid deserts, explored treacherous jungles, and ultimately sailed over large parts of the globe. Sacred texts, sculptures, skulls, drawings, and paintings reveal the worldwide presence of these black people. In all of the artwork, the black female is very prominent. Her figurines have been discovered in Western Europe, the Mediterranean, Western Asia, India, and in vast parts of the prehistoric New World. Even in our modern era, scattered around the globe, we see descendants of the black woman. For example, in Jordan, India, Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Hawaii, New Guinea, Australia, and Tasmania. We have seen the black woman as mother of the entire human family. We've also charted the course of her descendants around the world. Although she has left to us a global legacy, the black woman's most important and continuous contributions have been made on the continent of Africa.
As you can see, it is a huge continent, second only to Asia in size. Let us return then to Africa to see what exciting revelations await us there. In a brilliant article written in the Journal of African Civilization's 1987 edition, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries provides an overview of the image of black women in African cave art. Just as many scholars before her, she found that perhaps the most ancient artwork, dating back 10,000 years, was discovered in the central Sahara region. But other rock paintings were also found in North, East, West, Central, and South Africa. What does this art tell us about ancient African women? According to Jeffries, it presents them in a variety of ways. Some paintings show black women in a symbolic manner as primordial mother or mother nature who creates and nurtures all life. Certain sculptured pieces appear to represent fertility and motherhood, which were highly regarded by African people. A number of paintings show women gathered together wearing curious masks and vulture headdresses. In still other scenes, we find women talking together, posing, dancing, carrying pottery vessels, and relaxing with their children. One of the most popular of the prehistoric paintings is a depiction of two young ladies referred to as Puel women. Their attire is surprisingly similar to modern dress. A universal figure is the horned goddess who is depicted in graceful running strides with horns on her head surmounted by a pot-shaped hat. African legends speak of horns as being symbolic in calling together a nation. As we move toward later historical times, we meet the African woman, but this time she has settled along the Nile River. It was in this region that the most ancient and continuous civilization in the world appears to have arisen, first in Nubia and then in Egypt. Of course, not all scholars agree on the origin of the Egyptian civilization. In part one of this series, however, we cited a growing body of evidence that points toward a black or Nubian beginning, which is consistent with ancient tradition. In his book, The African Background to Medical Science, Dr. Charles Finch sheds further light on the black roots of Egyptian civilization. He points out that the Egyptians named themselves Camus, which translates literally as the blacks. Their words for the African land to the south of them was Kentu, or Kentu, denoting the Sudanese peoples who lived there. This word also meant first, foremost, beginning, origin, and chief. The Egyptians also referred to inner Africa as the old country and the land of the gods, or as we might say today, God's country. Furthermore, the Egyptian word for east was the same as their word for left, and their word for west the same as their word for right. Their word for front was the same as the word for south, and the word for back was the same as the word for north. According to Dr. Finch, all of this was possible only if the Egyptians oriented themselves southward and looked in that direction for the land of their origins. Another source of evidence in support of the view that the ancient Egyptians were black people is the Christian Bible. In Genesis, Noah's three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, are presented as the ancestors of the three main branches of humankind known to biblical writers. Ham is unquestionably the ancestor of the black race, and his name appears to have come from the Egyptian Cam, meaning black. The sons of Ham were listed as follows. Mizraim equals Egypt. Cush was Ethiopia. Canaan was Palestine. And Foot was Libya. It is clear then that also, according to biblical tradition, Egypt was a part of the black or African branch of humanity. Finally, this painting from the tomb of Ramesses III, dating back to about 1200 BC, shows that the ancient Egyptians viewed themselves as blacks and painted themselves as such without confusion with the Indo-Europeans, that is the Caucasians, or the Semites. In figure A, we have the ancient Egyptians as they viewed themselves. Figure B depicts the Indo-European type. Figure C represents other black Africans. And figure D 
represents the Semites. Throughout their history, the ancient Egyptians never depicted themselves by types B or D. In ancient Egypt, Kemet, the black land, as elsewhere in Africa, women were very prominent. Their diverse roles included goddess, queen mother, and pharaoh. We have learned about the great Isis and her tradition, but there were also other black goddesses of distinction. To discuss this, we return to Danita Red Terry in studio. Ice was um, the female god of war and of hunting, and she's probably the oldest known uh, female deity uh, of ancient Egypt. She um, was uh, depicted often wearing a red crown, red crown I should say, or uh, with uh, two crossed arrows and a shield on her head, so, uh, signifying her uh, her uh, characteristic as a, a war god. Uh, she was also considered to be uh, a, de a devoted mother god. Uh, some of her depictions show her as a, a drawn or depicted as a vulture. And in one of the myths, myths that's associated with her, she, um, as a vulture, pierced her thigh with her beak and drew blood from that and fed her children uh, this blood. Hathor um, is a, another mother god, and she was depicted as often as a cow, and or as a woman with cow-like ears on her on her head. Uh, she her symbols associated with her were the sistrum, and she was often depicted with the pharaohs who saw themselves as Horus reborn or as the god reborn would be seen suckling uh, from her as a cow, uh, they would suckle from her tithers, or as a woman in her woman form, they would sit on her and suckle at her breast. And she was also um, a, female, uh, a god, female god associated with music, with dance, with love, and uh, with uh, sensual pleasures of, of love also. And the sistrum, which I said was associated with her, uh, was a rattle uh, like a musical instrument. Uh, some of the other uh, female gods include uh, Bast or Bastet, which was often uh, depicted as uh, having the head of a cat or a head of a female lion. And she was a god of war. You have Mut, Mute, who was also uh, sometimes associated as a god of war. She was uh, a regional uh, god of the Thebes Luxor area, and she was part of a trinity of Cones and Cones, which is her son, and Amun, who was a very important deity during the 17th and 18th uh, dynasty uh, period. You have Newt who was the mother of Isis, and she was a mother goddess who was shown, often depicted, uh, as going across the heavens. Her whole body would stretch across the heavens and meet the earth uh, in these depictions, and, she would, and stars would be scattered about her, and the sun would be in the sky with her. And then you have her daughter, uh, Nephthys, who was a guardian um, uh, female god. The Egyptians believed that the king or pharaoh possessed divine powers and embodied the strength, vitality, and authority of God. His role was well defined as ruler of the nation. In spite of this, Egyptian women had a special place on the throne. First, they were guardians of the royal lineage. That is, most male heirs did not become pharaohs until after they married a princess of royal blood. In many cases, this meant that a young man married his full-blooded sister, as is depicted here in the union of the pharaoh Amos and his queen Amos Nefertari. Secondly, as we shall see in part three of this series in the case of Queen Hatshepsut, if a deceased pharaoh's legal heir was too young to rule, or the king left no male heir, then the queen was permitted to head the nation. The queens of Egypt played a vital role on the throne. A number of them rose to prominence from about 3000 B.C. to 1800 B.C. during the Old and Middle Kingdoms. First dynasty, you have a woman known as Mermite. And according to W.B. Emery, Walter B. Emery, in a book called Archaic Egypt, it was published in 1965, he identifies her as a monarch. 
-hmm. as a living horror. So, um, and she is the third or fourth ruler of dynastic chemists. So Myrnite is very important, but unfortunately, because of the antiquity of the time in which she lived, we don't know a lot about her. Mm -hmm. Her tomb seems to be one of the largest tombs in the first two dynasties. This is called the Archaic Period or the Early Dynastic Period. Now, in the fourth dynasty, you have a woman known as Queen Hetheris. Now, she was not a monarch, but she was the wife of a man known as Sneferoth, who commissioned two massive pyramids, and she is the mother of Khufu. Mm -hmm. one, of the great, one of the great pharaohs. Exactly. But when you get to the sixth dynasty, which is the last dynasty in what's called the Old Kingdom, the first golden age, you have a woman known as Nitocris, and undoubtedly that's her Greek name. Nitocris comes after Pepi II, who, as you know, had the longest recorded reign in world history, 94 years. She is described by Herodotus and others as the noblest, the loveliest, the most just woman of her time. And I believe Herodotus even goes as far as to say that the pyramid that is normally ascribed to Menkara by Mycerinus is actually that of Nitocris. Mm. So she's very significant. Those are the women that stand out in the first several dynasties. Now after the um, sixth dynasty, of course you have what's called the first intermediate period. This is an age of social uh, disorder and uh, confusion. And then you have the 10th dynasty in which a black king, once again from the south, moves up, conquers um, the two lands, northern and southern Egypt, and unifies Kemet for the second time that we are aware of in history. That is Nephepet Ra Mentehotep, who reigned for 51 years. Now, he had two great queens. One is Kawit, the other is Ashayet. Now, perhaps the most interesting thing here is that we know about Mentehotep II largely because of his statue in the Cairo Museum, the black statue that portrays him in the divine color of ancient Kemet, the color of God, the color of divinity, the color of black. But interestingly enough, his queens are also oftentimes portrayed in that same color. And I will draw your attention to a piece, I believe it's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, maybe in the Cairo Museum, that depicts both of these queens, Kawit and Ashayet, in that same divine color. Mm -hmm. We don't know much about them. The 11th dynasty, I may have said the 10th dynasty, but actually this is the 11th dynasty, lasts about 100 years. And it's a transitional period. But in the 12th dynasty, once again, we see women very, very, very powerful. You have, in particular, the last known monarch of Dynasty 12, a woman known as Sebek Neferoth. She is the wife, I'm sorry, the daughter of Amenemhet III. While the goddesses and queens of Egypt have a very special place in history, it was the average woman of that land whose independence and respect surprised ancient foreigners and still baffle us today. The Greek writer Herodotus, whom some have called the father of history, has stated, the Egyptians themselves in their manners and customs seem to have reversed the ordinary practices of mankind. For instance, women attend market and are employed in trade, while men stay at home and do the weaving. Of course, Egyptian men did more than weave if they weaved at all. There were pharaohs, governors, judges, doctors, priests, warriors, laborers, and so forth. However, Herodotus was struck by the role of women in Egyptian society, and well he should have been, for in his native Greece, women were very much confined to their homes. They rarely appeared in public and had few if any rights and privileges men were bound to respect. As a matter of fact, in many instances, the parents of Greek girls arranged their marriages at an early age and paid a rich dowry for the honor. These young ladies received no mental or physical training, but were taught to spin, cook, to obey their husbands, and to otherwise remain quiet and modest. But for thousands of years, the Egyptian woman and her sisters in other parts of Africa enjoyed more legal rights and privileges than any other women of their time and than most women of today. The family unit was the most ancient and cherished institution in Egypt. Young men were urged to take a wife as soon as they were able to support her financially. Egyptian literature is filled with love poems between young men and women who affectionately called each other brother and sister. One such young lady wrote the following to her lover. My heart flutters hastily when I think of my love for you. It lets me not act sensibly. It leaps from its place. It lets me not put on a dress nor wrap my scarf around me. I put no paint upon my eyes. I'm even not anointed with perfume. 
Egyptian woman was well loved and respected by her family. Although her spouse was the head of the house, she was indeed responsible for running the household. Um, they certainly controlled the hearth and the home, of course. They also controlled fields in many, many instances. The, um, um, uh, the agricultural situation in Egypt because the most important agricultural deities at first were women, Aset or Isis being the best example. We know that uh, women had legal rights, independent legal rights. We know that um, children in ancient Egypt derived their names and therefore le their legitimacy through their mothers and through the maternal line and therefore took their names from their mothers as we said. An ancient elder left a record of sound advice for young Egyptian husbands. He wrote, do not control your wife in her house when you know she is efficient. Don't say to her, where is it? Get it. When she has put it in the right place. Let your eye observe in silence. Then you recognize her skill. It is joy when your hand is with her. If a man desists from strife at home, he will not encounter its beginning. Every man who founds a household should hold back the hasty heart. Do not go after another woman. Let her not steal your heart. Thousands of paintings depict interesting scenes of Egyptian family life. They show husbands, wives and children eating, hunting, fishing, enjoying music and traveling along the Nile together. Family stability seems to have prevailed throughout the long history of this nation. Sexual discrimination in employment appears to have been unknown in Egypt. Alongside men and with others of their gender, women ground corn, brewed beer and baked bread. Women dominated certain professions. For example, most of the dancers, acrobats, and musicians were female. Women also held high positions in commerce and industry. This was especially true in the manufacturing of state textiles and perfume. Egyptians loved banquets and parties where married couples often socialized. Here is a typical dinner party at which women playing drums and flutes entertained their guests. The Egyptian pharaoh governed the nation on the basis of mayat, a divine concept of law and justice. Under this system, women enjoyed equal status and civil rights with men. Women independently executed wills, witnessed documents, inherited, bought, administered, and sold property, adopted children, and filed lawsuits. Scholars have traditionally held that Western law and jurisprudence had their origin in ancient Greece. This view is now open to debate. As an attorney, I was very interested in the ancient Egyptian legal system. I was especially surprised to learn of the will of Lady Nanakte. As a result of that, I decided to engage in research on the will on my own. Attorney Clegg, your trial has been continued over till tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. As a nation, Egypt predated Greece by thousands of years. The ancient Egyptians enacted many laws and created a very advanced legal system, which at various times included judges and juries. Recent research clearly demonstrates that the ancient Greeks derived much of their philosophy, science, architecture, religion, and medicine from the ancient Egyptians. Further investigation may well reveal that Egyptian law was also the basis of that of ancient Greece. In our effort to study the will of the ancient Egyptian noble lady Nanakte, we visited the research library at the University of California at Los Angeles and the Central Library downtown Los Angeles. The independence of this ancient Egyptian woman was made clear by her surviving will, which we found in the 1945 edition of the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology. A wealthy widow of some stature, Lady Nanakte had married twice and inherited property from both husbands and her father. She left her own personal property and her share of the last husband's estate to some of her eight children, but disinherited the others for lack of consideration toward her. To show how advanced the ancient Egyptians were and how much we have learned from them, it should be noted that Lady Nanakte's will was notarized and formally included on the court docket. As we have seen during the early history of Egypt, 
women of the nation were generally equal to men in many respects. Even so, the position of pharaoh or crowned head of the country was almost always held by a man. Nevertheless, there came a time when three extraordinary royal women took center stage. It was during the 17th Egyptian dynasty, a period of great humiliation. The Egyptians had been conquered by foreigners, probably Asians, called Hyksos. The great royal mother, Tetishiri, her daughter, Ahatep, and her granddaughter, Nefertari, played critical roles in freeing the nation from foreign rule. Let us recapture the significance of that troubled time in black history. While filming the drama for the Daughters of Isis, we were joined behind the scenes on the set by Nzinga Ratavisha Heru, chairperson of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations. Nzinga, thank you so much for taking out of your busy schedule and appearing on the set of the Daughters of Isis to be our guest today. We certainly appreciate your contribution. Thank and thank you, you LeGrand, for the opportunity. As a rule, we look at history from a male perspective. Even when we think of the origin of the United States, we speak of the founding fathers. In ancient Africa, however, there, is a, there are times when we speak of founding mothers. Can you speak to that? The founding mothers are a very integral part of African history. As a matter of fact, in this particular case, what had happened is Egypt was ruled under the domination of the Hyksos. They were, in fact, the Asians. So what had happened is all the royal families were pushed to the south. And actually, Egypt was there under domination by outsiders. Mm -hmm. However, they had to go to the south to organize, to actually strategize for the liberation efforts to regain Egypt. And that was done by a sister named Tetesheri. Tetesheri and her husband worked very hard to overthrow the Hyksos. What had then happened was her daughter, Ahotep, then joined the fight to help regain this country. When her husband was killed in battle, it was Ahotep, a sister, woman, warrior, who went out there and led the troops to overturn these foreign invaders that had come to monopolize their land. They battled until, again, another daughter came, and that daughter is known as Amhos. Nefertari. Now, Amhos Nefertari is the one that is long some praise because she is clearly of Nubian stock, but it was she and her husband who were actually the founders of the 18th dynasty. Let us now turn to the 17th dynasty and visit a scene from the lives of two of the founding mothers of the 18th, Tertiary and Nefertari. <laughs> which troubles my heart. 
1,000 seasons ago, our nation was rich and powerful. It was our second golden age. Our ancestors controlled the vast Nile Valley. There were great pharaohs such as Menahotep II, Amenemet III, Sinashrep the first and second, who reigned supreme. And there were great queens like Kunit and Asherah. Then mother, which dynasty was this? The 11th and 12th dynasties. It was our most glorious days since the pyramids were built. The people prospered, the land was fertile, and the gods were pleased. But at the end of the 12th dynasty, a human plague struck our land. A human plague? Do you mean like an epidemic? No. It was a mob of a strange people, a pale-faced race. We call them Sixos, rulers of a foreign land. They burned our city, destroyed the temples, massacred many of the men and enslaved the women and children. The royal family was stripped of their authority and banished from the throne. Were the kings and queens killed too? No. Fortunately, many of them managed to escape the barbarians, and they fled south into New England. For 200 seasons, our people have been in exile, first in Nubia, and now in Egypt. But when the war is over, we will reclaim all of our land and go home. Grandmother, tell me about the war. When did it start? Your father selected the proud man, and he could not bear the shame of seeing Egypt under foreign rule. Did father start the war? It was because of the arrogance of the Hyksos king, Apophis. Arrogance? What did he do? Well, long before you were born, we left Nubia and, and re-established the capital of Egypt here in Thebes. Our palace was not so many miles from the Hyksos invaders, and our presence threatened the king. Threatened the king? But, Grandmother, they were on our land. What nerve. Yes. But you see, the king sent a warning to your father, warning him that the noise of the hippopotamuses were too loud and he could not sleep, so the animals should be killed. What? The hippopotamuses were too loud? Was this some kind of Hicksos joke? There was no joke. It was an insult of the worst kind. You see, the cry of the hippopotamus is a symbol of the authority of the pharaoh. Grandmother, you mean like the pyramids are symbols of ancient wisdom? Yes. You see, the Hyksos king challenged the authority of your father. He could not hear the cry of the hippopotamuses. It was his way of using a message to stir up the anger of your father. I know my father didn't stand for that. No, he didn't. He mobilized the army and made a courageous drive against the Hyksos barbarians. Well, that is when father was killed. I remember my mother telling me of this. She said that when he came of age, my eldest brother, Kamos, continued the war after father had died. Your mother was much too modest, my child. After your father's death, it was she who brought the troops together and led them to battle after battle. Kalos, 
to them. It's like your blood. Jacob's was killed. And now, Queen Tetesheri, grandmother of Nefertari, did indeed echo down the corridors of history. For generations, Nefertari, the chief queen and sister of King Amos, was worshipped by the Egyptian people. She bore several sacred titles, including royal daughter, great royal wife, and divine mother. Nefertari and her family were widely praised for liberating Egypt from foreign domination. According to a number of distinguished Egyptologists, from Flinders Petrie to William Leo Hansberry, this great queen was the most revered person in the entire history of the Nile Valley. Indeed, a distinguished daughter of Isis. In part three of this series, we shall begin with the 18th dynasty of Egypt, which was the extended family of Queen Nefertari. We shall explore the lives of such eminent women as the Pharaoh Hatshepsut, Queen Tia, and Queen Nefertiti. We shall also recapture the lives and times of Ethiopia's empresses and warrior queens. Finally, we shall examine the role of the Black Madonna in Africa, Europe, and Asia. This concludes part two of the Clegg series, The Daughters of Isis, Black Women in Antiquity. Music 